In today's report, I recently went to China to check out some factories. And while I was there, it made my head explode. At the end of 2023, the Chinese overtook South Korea and jumped on the automotive sales podium here in Australia. Since then, the top three countries from which we get our cars are in order. Japan, about 380,000 cars from Japan. Then Thailand, which also means mainly Japanese cars, only made with slightly cheaper labour to a slightly lower standard. About 270,000 cars there. And China, about 180,000 cars. 2025 is interesting because it's going to be the year when Chinese brands you've never heard of or are at least grossly unfamiliar with at this point are going to metastasize through the Australian automotive market. There's nothing we can do about this. It's underway presently. And it's going to guaranteed upend established Japanese and South Korean car makers who've had a long time to plan for this but seemingly have done nothing to cope. Chinese brands MG and GWM are already both top 10 sellers here in Australia. The only brand named after a stripper, Cherry, is here now also. And so is BYD, LDV, Havel, rhymes with gravel, Zika, Photon, Depal, Jaku and JAC. If that's not enough, on the way this year, GAC... A-I-O-N, A-I-ON, <laughs> Geely, Denza, Skywell, Leap Motor, Rolala, which is pronounced in an unknown way and spelt R-O-E-W-E, and Xpeng, all coming soon to a showroom near you. Now, if that's not enough, and frankly it is, but if it's not enough, all pole stars are really Chinese. I know they would say Swedish, but they're actually made in China and owned by Geely in China. And in my view, simply maintaining a P.O. box in Gothenburg really doesn't count for that much. Geely also owns Volvo, of course, and some Volvos here in Australia, such as the XC60, I think, already come from China. Although how clearly this is disclosed in dealerships is unknown. Probably not very. And let's not forget Tesla. Every Tesla on sale today in Australia is a Chinese car, a Chinese-made car. In five years' time, I'd suggest owning a Chinese car is going to be about as controversial as owning a Hyundai or a Kia today. So get used to it. China is actually the world's top exporter of manufactured products one of only three countries in the trillion dollar export club in US dollars. Three and a half trillion US dollars, to be precise. The other two are America, which is about 500 billion greenbacks behind, and Germany at just over two trillion US dollars, I think. We export Endless Australian crapola to China too. So it's a bilateral trade deal, obviously. The top 10 items that we send there are iron ore, coal, and the coal would be both thermal and metallurgical. Thermal, obviously, for power generation and metallurgical for the manufacture of steel. Plus natural gas, gold, food, wool, copper, and beverages, because we are pretty good at beverages here in Australia. And yeah, dude, I know that's really only eight things, and I did say 10, but officially food is broken down into three categories, dairy, meat, and grains, and I just bundled them all up to together because, hey, food. The bottom line is that on trade, we are joined at the hip to China. That's a done deal. They need our resources. And you, I would argue, really don't want to live without all the shit that they make and send here at a fairly good price. Because, of course, you might be able to buy some of it from Germany at, I don't know, 10 times the price. And that might stick in the Australian craw somewhat, faced with that proposition. Now, this gets complex quickly, okay? Because at the end of the pandemic, the launch of the current model Ford Ranger was delayed because 
I think it was 393 unique parts from China were simply unavailable. This is an American brand making a ute in Thailand for Australia, which got stalled on the grid because 400 parts from China were simply not forthcoming. Hashtag globalization. Most ranger owners would probably not consider their ute to be 5 to 10% Chinese, but hey, dude, facts are facts. So isn't it time that we had a properly grown-up conversation about the state of Chinese manufacturing and what the future looks like for Australia? If you say made in China to a median bogan here in Australia, said median bogan is going to get an image in his head of quality and cost, right? Both pretty low. And my favourite in-house example of dodgy Chinese manufacturing is this gorgeous tool-mastered tap wrench. What a thing of beauty. Five parts. It's got two handles, a body, and two hardened jaws. And it's an altogether terrible tool, even when manufactured well, which this one, frankly, is not. Mainly because the dynamic jaw is supposed to be connected to the handle with a left-handed thread, and the handle is supposed to thread through the body with a right-handed thread, which gives you this acceleration of the jaw when you twist the handle. It's kind of clever. It's an established piece of design. Lots of tap wrenches are this way. Unfortunately for this tap wrench, however, the manufacturing tolerances was so preposterously crap that the jaw simply does not thread onto the handle. It just falls out. So yay, well done, Chinese manufacturing. And I know I could have taken it back and they would have replaced it with a slightly less crap one that worked slightly better, but I kept it for its <laughs> inherent sentimental value. This kind of experience, and we've all had them, colours one's perception of Chinese manufacturing. But that is really not the full story. I had a generally cheap, nasty impression of Chinese manufacturing until recently when I actually went there to check it out. This is the Ryzen production base in Ninghai, China. This massive factory beneath this solar array is roughly 1 million square metres, which is around about 100 football fields. The total investment to produce this factory is more than 3 billion Australian dollars, and the annual production capacity is 15 gigawatts. The most impressive thing of all is the mad collection of photovoltaic producing robots beneath my feet. So let's go and check that out right now. Ryzen is one of the world's leading manufacturers of solar panels. It has roughly 15,000 employees of which more than 1,000 professional propeller heads work actively in R&D. The company holds over 740 proprietary patents. You can't miss them because you have to drive right past them to visit the production line, which you can't walk onto without wearing the full anti-static frock. And then, entertainingly, they blow you. <laughs> to make sure you don't bring in any dust. It's basically the full Skynet freak show out there with cutting edge robotic automation. Crystalline wafers that are less than four thousandths of an inch thick get scurried about by robots. They rocket down an automated production line and they are subjected to dozens of tightly controlled doping and layering processes in a surgically clean science fiction set. It's a decent four or 500 metre stroll from one end of the cell production line to the other. Endless processes with built-in testing take place. There are, of course, multiple production lines in parallel. I had one impression in my head of manufacturing in China, and this, frankly, was not it. The minders who took us through were the full brainiacs too. They spoke binary, and I struggled to keep up. I've been to car factories and R&D centres in Japan, Europe, South Korea, 
and Ryzen's factory in China is right up there. If I hadn't been wearing a surgical mask, dude, my jaw would have been on the floor. There are people at Ryzen and all they do is think about heterogeneous junctions, zero bus bar technology, optimizing metallic paste and advanced interconnection systems, et frick, etc. It's closer to rocket science than you might think and a lot more reliable than SpaceX. This is properly advanced technology and they develop it in-house. This is the end of the line, literally. We've just seen thousands of cells rocketing down here, each one precisely controlled and miraculously enough, less than 100 microns thick, which is the thickness of a human hair. And they're being packaged up right here to go next door to be turned into panels. Just behind the ladies in pink here is the first time that these cells get exposed to sunlight. It happens in the blink of an eye and every cell that rockets down this line is tested for functionality before it goes over there. At this point, I'm gonna challenge you in the comments below to show me any company in Australia with 1,000 professionals working in R&D. Australia's biggest manufacturer, can you guess? It's Blue Scope Steel, which has 16,500 employees. And the next is, do you want to guess again? Anyone? Visi, which takes out the trash and makes cardboard boxes. 11,000 employees there. Now, I'm not exactly sure how much R&D takes place with cardboard boxes today or garbage bin emptying and things of that nature, or even steel, which is a fairly established concept. But I am absolutely certain that you don't need a thousand people to do that R&D. So for me, this was a huge reality check. Turning the cells into panels is a far more conventional production line kind of process. It's more like the manufacturing that you're used to looking at, I guess. Certainly the manufacturing that I've been exposed to. Less Skynet and more humans, but still pretty high tech. Plenty of robots and plenty of places you really shouldn't put your fingers. It's pretty hard for me to convey the scale of this operation, so let me put it to you like this. At the end of 2023, Ryzen had production capacity of 35 gigawatts. And I know that's a big scary number, right? So it might not be that relatable. It's just power, like two kilowatts coming out of the wall or something, only a lot more than that like a really, really, really bright light bulb or something. It's the hypothetical power output of all the panels that Ryzen can make in one year, okay? 35 gigawatts. Now, how does that measure up? Here in Australia, if we crank our entire electricity grid, 96 gigawatts. One company in China headquartered in what they would call a, quote, small city of, quote, just 10 million people can churn out solar panels roughly equivalent to more than one third of the total installed power generation capacity of our nation. Just let that sink in, okay? They already have plans in place to double that production capacity. Many Australians, including me until recently, incidentally, have this whole sweatshop technology ripoff perception of the term made in China. And I get that that's a thing and it's probably still happening. Back in the financial crisis, Ford narrowly sidestepped the Chapter 11 bankruptcy that befell GM and Chrysler. You probably remember that peripherally if you're interested in the car market, okay? And they did it by having a fire sale. They sold Aston Martin to the Middle East and they got rid of Land Rover and Jaguar. They went to India and Volvo went to Geely in China for 1.8 billion US dollars. And I don't frankly think that Geely gave two shits about Volvo the brand. They just wanted to inject Western technology into their range broadly and it was cheaper to buy Volvo than to do it any other way. That was back in 2010. 
So we have to fast forward 15 years to today, right? And there's been an incredible point of inflection in Chinese manufacturing. China no longer has to buy Western technology to get by and make stuff. If you go to Ryzen and swing a cat, the next thing you're going to see is like 20 PhD propeller heads unconscious on the freaking floor. Like those patents up on the wall are real. They did it themselves. They've got their own brains trust. Pretty clearly, they've become very good at innovation while over here, we've been obsessed with things like, I don't know, pronouns, net zero, the voice. This has been an epic, covert, overtaking maneuver by China. We're increasingly dependent on China, but they also need us to keep the fires burning and the raw materials flooding in and the food, like food, so useful. What remains to be seen is whether, well, how would you put it, that whether that codependency can be maintained in a reasonably amicable way. I certainly hope it can. This final bit is going to make your head explode, dude, like if it hasn't already. Back in 1983, and I know I'm such an old fart, but that was the year after I started university, someone named Professor Martin Green, of whom you've probably never heard, started work on a new kind of solar cell. And he did this at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Basically, Professor Green achieved a 50% efficiency improvement in solar cells with his technology, which was called PERC, P-E-R-C. You can look it up. I wrote a story about that in a magazine called The Bulletin in the early 1990s, and I remember thinking how fucking brainy Australia was. I was a very idealistic young engineer at the time. PERC was not commercialised, until 2012, because it takes a lot of brainiac legwork to get nice ideas into production. But after that, dude, it dominated. And by 2021, over 90% of solar cells globally were based on that perk Australian technology developed at the University of New South Wales. It was actually awarded the 2022 Millennium Technology Prize the 2023 Vin Future Grand Prize and the 2023 Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. And you don't get any of them in a cornflakes packet, dude. You have to achieve properly epic shit to get any one. And Professor Green got three. His former PhD student, Dr. Zheng Rongxi, went out and set up one of the world's largest solar panel manufacturing companies in China not Ryzen. Today, over 80% of the world's solar panels come from China. Vietnam, Malaysia, the US, Canada, South Korea and India are the next six solar manufacturing countries. And they're all fighting over the market scraps of roughly 20%, the bit that China doesn't make, okay? There's a little piece of Australia, I would argue, in every one of those cells. It's fair to say that they would not exist without the Brainiac development work that was done here. But we don't make panels here in any significant quantity, and I doubt we ever will. I think there are two small companies in Australia making solar panels. It's unclear if we benefit in any way from developing this technology, which changed the world and makes epic operations like Ryzen's possible. I guess... The one benefit is we get a pretty solid supply of affordable, high-quality panels, and that's not trivial. And I'm not trying to be biased either way here. I'm just giving you the facts of which you can make whatever you want. And I'd love you to let me know what you think about all of this in the comments.